welcome to the world of chiropractic, where we take one epic journey around the world as we explore the seven regions of the World Federation of Chiropractic. My name is Dr. Rebecca Wilkes, and I invite you to travel with me as we go on this exciting adventure around the globe. wonderful opportunity to speak with Dr. Martin Camera. Hopefully I said that right. So thank you, Dr. Camera, for uh, being with us today, for donating your time to us today, and for telling us a little bit about your life as a chiropractor. So, so you actually ended up going to Palmer West. Yes. Yeah, I wanted to be in California. My parents wanted me to go to the original school of chiropractic because so I had very limited information. And at that time, there were only two campuses. And, you know, you're a, a young man from the Philippines and you're thinking, Iowa, California, Iowa, <laughs> California. It wasn't so difficult. <laughs> I can see that. <laughs> did you stay in the U.S. for a little bit or did you go straight to school and come right back to the Philippines? Yes, I, I went straight to school and right back to the Philippines. I, uh, you know, I liked my experience in the U.S., but really, I've always looked at the Philippines as home, and I always wanted to be a pioneer and start the profession in a very strong way. And I was eager to get back and to, to, to get things going, you know? And from what I understand, um, your dad, when he found out about the chiropractic choice you made, he wasn't initially excited about that. Is that correct? So, you know, in our family, it's a very traditional Spanish-Filipino family, right? So, uh, so everything was very traditional. So at first, he was disappointed. I, I would say uh, yes. And of course, there was cost involved, right? Uh, everything is, you have no student loans and everything. And it's expensive if you're coming from a third world developing country going to the U.S. to study. And so cost was an issue and all of that. But uh, having said that, um, I'm the only practicing Dr. Camera in the Philippines carrying on the legacy and the name that he's made. I'm actually involved in academe, research, and government the same way he was. Most of my brothers who are MD are practicing in the U.S., so I actually, I'm, I'm the only uh, practicing Dr. Camera in the Philippines. And I think that, would, that made him proud in the later years of his life. My dad was patient number 001. He made sure that he was the very first patient that I treated. The other ironic thing was that initially he was disappointed, but I was the only one in a specialization that could help him, that he needed. Dad was a cardiologist, in fact, he was the first cardiologist in the Philippines and he's somewhat legendary because he holds the highest grade point average ever obtained in the, in, the, in the most difficult medical school in the country. He was literally raising people from the dead because, you know, potassium sodium pumps was new information then. And he was giving people salt and bananas and taking them out of comas and so he, he had a wonderful reputation. I'm the youngest in a family of 12. I have seven older brothers and four older sisters. Um, he was strongly encouraged to go into healthcare and medicine. And so by the time I was graduating from college, my oldest brother is 17 years older than me. I, every single specialization was taken, right? So there was ophthalmology, psychiatry, cardiology, pulmonology, and they had married medical doctors. So, you know, there was dermatology and all of that. And I was like, okay, I want to get into something new. And at that time, I was very interested in sports. I was uh, very athletic in my high school and college years. So the natural transition would have been to going to rehab or physical medicine or going to orthopedics. At that time, I had a brother who was doing his residency in psychiatry in the U.S., and he said, you know what? There are these people in the hospital doing rounds and they're chiropractors and they seem to know what they're doing. So I looked up the profession. At that time, there was no internet, right? You had to actually look up an index, look at the listing of schools. I had to physically write the school and wait months for a reply. And I did research on the profession 
uh, got into it and I actually love the concept of a natural drugless non-surgical approach to health and to sports injuries. I'll be honest with you, I had no idea it was alternative. I went, uh, you know, eyes wide shut, I guess you could say, and landed in the U.S. to go to chiropractic school. Seems like you kind of hit the ground running, what we call it in the U.S. Yep, absolutely. I was invited to a, a debate in by hosted by the Philippine Orthopedic Association in the biggest hospital in, in, in Makati, so the prime hospital. They put me in front of an older rehab medicine doctor to debate against on on treatment for natural, uh, sorry, non-surgical treatments for back pain. And I went and I stood my ground. So um, very early on, I was involved in politics. Uh, um, there was the initial lobbying phases for the Alternative and Medical Practice Act of 1997. So before it was signed into law in 1997, I was already meeting with uh, the, sec the senator and the secretaries and actually was successful at getting chiropractic included in that act. At that time, there was only two practicing chiropractors in the Philippines. No, less than five. I mean, I, I forget the actual number. And that is the law that ensures us protection at this time. So what happened in Indonesia cannot happen in the Philippines. What happened in Indonesia? It was a, the wild, wild west of chiropractic. You had people selling programs and packages of 100 visits, and people were buying them. They were gobbling them up. A lot of uh, foreign practitioners. Um, one lady dies after a chiropractic adjustment, and uh, the chiropractor goes rogue. He actually runs away from the law. It had nothing to do with patient care, had nothing to do with the need of the community. It had nothing to do with providing value. All they were talking about was money, 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 money. And it was disgusting. It was really disgusting. So um, uh, the death was really, whether it could have been prevented or not, we don't know, right? Because what happened was, the patient went to the hospital because she was still in pain and they did an opium drip on her and they put all sorts of like cocktails in her and she could have had her, and then they proceeded to do two or three more and she passed away the following day. And because she was Muslim, they didn't do an autopsy. So the cause of death is really, may or may not have been the chiropractic adjustment, but the profession got blamed for it. Once there's evidence of harm, then, then it's a very difficult or uphill battle. So, so this, this is something that we have to be really um, be guarding against. Uh, in, in the Philippines where you have tuberculosis is endemic in the population. And that's not something that you'll see in the US. And of course, you'll know that there is tuberculosis of the spine, POTS disease, mm -hmm. which is you probably will not see a case of that in the US. So when you have cases of tuberculosis, Philippine medical doctors are, are, are number one at that because they treat it all the time. So um, uh, if you come to a country like the Philippines, you know, you need to enculturate, you need to know what are the healthcare conditions affecting majority of the people. You need to be able to screen for those things and not just do, you know, very aggressive manipulations on somebody who may have uh, POTS disease of the spine. You know what I mean? Because again, all it takes is one documented evidence of harm and we've got a problem. The whole profession has a problem. Exactly. So you're a presidential appointee um, as the chairman of the National Certification Committee on Chiropractic within the Philippine yeah. Institute of Traditional and Alternative Healthcare. Does that yeah. have to do with this whole picture or tell us a little bit about that? Okay, so the Traditional and Alternative Medical Act of 1997 called for the creation of a government-owned and controlled corporation called the Philippine Institute of Traditional and Alternative Healthcare. 
The role of that organization is a research institute for traditional medicine, number one. Number two is to uh, look at the development and integration of complementary and alternative medicine like acupuncture and chiropractic into the healthcare system to improve health of the masses. Wow. So it's, it's a really tall order, right? So that law, uh, so we looked at, uh, it's an institute that registers practitioners. It actually uh, registers clinics and registers training centers. So it provides a legal basis for people to practice chiropractic in the Philippines. So my role there is as a board of trustees. That institute is largely responsible for the development of these professions in the country, including chiropractic. No? You just referenced your work with academia. So in February of 2019, uh, they signed the Universal Healthcare Law of the Philippines. So it's a, it's a landmark uh, law, okay? now. That law uh, calls for the creation of a scientific council called the Healthcare Technology Assessment Council. We're attached to the Department of Health, okay? But we will eventually be moved to the Department of Science and Technology. So uh, I sit on this council with uh, 30 of probably the foremost experts in Philippine academia and research. And our role is basically to review all healthcare technologies, whether it's a surgical procedure, a pharmaceutical, a device, if it's traditional medicine, if it's a vaccine, it has to go through our council. And our council is the only recommendatory body to the Department of Health, and the PhilHealth Board of Directors. So let me put that in English. If the government is going to spend money on it, we have to approve it. Okay. So if chiropractic is to be covered by the Philippine Insurance Corporation, it would have to go through this council and they would have to do the scientific review for that. Okay. Wow. So you have a lot of key positions. And as you move towards the world, I understand you are a group member of the primary rehab interventions on low back pain within the World Health Organization. Is that correct? That is correct. Yeah, that is correct. So that is a, it's the, it's the second time actually I've been uh, asked to contribute to a major document. So the first one was the WHO guidelines on basic training and safety in chiropractic. So at that time, I was working with the Philippine government, PITAC, and they were asked to comment on the draft of this guideline. And I was the one who drafted the reply of the Philippines. And because I guess they were impressed with the content, they actually asked me to attend the consultation in Milan. And we finalized that document for them. I think that was released officially in 25 and 27, which became, I think, a landmark document for the chiropractic profession. The fact that the WHO had an official guideline. I understand you are CEO of Intercare Chiropractic <laughs> Centers Incorporated. No, uh, so Intercare is actually a, it started as a chiropractic center. So what ended up happening is, in the early 90s, I had created a multidisciplinary center which was integrated even before the word integration was, was big, right? So uh, I have rehab doctors, orthopedic doctors, physical therapists, massage therapists, acupuncturists, and chiropractors all working under one roof for patient benefit. Uh, so we have four centers uh, around Metro Manila. We're opening our fifth center in probably about two, three weeks. And we're actually in the process of, so that our, our largest clinic uh, center is going to be that building. So we're building a four-story building in Magallanes, which is also in Metro Manila, which will hopefully be, well, it will be, it's being built as a school, the first uh, educational program in the Philippines 
which is consistent with uh, the WHO guidelines on basic training and safety uh, for chiropractic. So we're putting up a training program. Yeah. Wow. And, yeah. and how do you navigate just working with a lot of different practitioners? I know that that can be pretty daunting at times. You know, we don't care who gets them better. We really don't. What we care about is that they get better. So I had a patient, let's say recently, where um, conservative care to the back of the knee wasn't getting the results that we needed. We did a musculoskeletal ultrasound, which we have in the clinic, and we saw she had a Baker cyst. I call in my orthopedic surgeon, and he does a drain. We drain 44 uh, uh, or fluid. I mean, that, normally when you do a drain, it's like 20 ml, right? We did 44 ml. It was incredible amounts of fluid. And then the therapy and the back pain and everything started getting better. So it's like this integration of, of different things that just make the person work. So as a chiropractor, I would like to stick with the skeletal alignment and and the nerve tone, you know? Um, you know, when D.D. Palmer talks about the concept neuro, of neurological tone, it's actually brilliant. It's actually brilliant. If you look at and you start studying, you know, what D.D. Palmer was talking about when he talked about tone and what, what that means, neurological tone. So as a chiropractor, uh, I'd like to focus on, um, on skeletal alignment and neurological tone uh, Dr. Donald McDowell from Australia has a wonderful paper on, on the concept of tone in chiropractic, which was just published maybe two or three years ago. And it, it's a brilliant paper. And it, it, it brings the concept into contemporary medicine, you know. So I would want to focus on that, right? But then I have issues that require mobility work or require stability work or require... Uh, strengthening, which a physical therapist is better placed to handle and has the time to spend one hour, you know, with a patient working with a structured exercise program. I, I love it when we get a hot low back and, you know, the kind that you can't move at all because they're in so much pain. And I have an orthopedist who can do facet injections in the clinic take the inflammation down and immediately the chiropractor comes in, does an adjustment and the patient walks out like, oh my God, like that look of relief in their face. It's just, that's what I live for. You know, it, it's just amazing. So I, you know, we navigate that by, by minimizing the egos, putting the patient at the center and creating a value system that is built around passion, integrity, commitment, Malasakit is a Tagalog word, and I'll explain it later on, and excellence. So, you, you know, so we all commit to those values. Um, the closest English word to malasakit is empathy. Like you feel for the person and you, you, you try to put yourself in their shoes and you do what you can. So. And so just knowing the tenets of how you maybe hire and what you were explaining just really provides a lot of insight into how someone might navigate an interprofessional setting if they were considering working in that. Yeah. And you also highlighted on the magic of, of just working together with other practitioners. We work around a, a principle called the PPOs, where we feel that the patient, the providers, and the organization has to benefit in a mutual way. You are the chiropractor to the Olympic team for the Philippines. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, um, it started in 2005. The Philippines was hosting the Southeast Asian Games. And I started working with one sport, which was the Philippine Amateur Swimming Association. And they were taking care of divers and swimming. So the two sports, diving and swimming. And uh, they, they invited me to, to help the athletes during the competition. It was an incredible experience because I had a freedom to do whatever I wanted to this like uh, amateur elite athletes. 
So I was able to set up a chiropractic table right underneath the diving board. And in between competitions, I was working with people and, and just getting people better. And uh, to make a long story short, they did amazing. Like they brought in uh, eight or 12 goals. I can't remember. It's 205, right? But to make a long story short, the president of the association went on record and said, all of those golds may have been silvers if it wasn't for chiropractic. He was that happy with what we did. In fact, it was a front page story in dynamic chiropractic at that time. Right. Now, because of that, um, I was tapped by the World Olympians Association to do work with the Turin Winter Games. And that was in 2006. And because it was so unusual for a tropical country to have a doctor going to the Winter Games for the World Olympic Association, it became a front story uh, paper, uh, a front, <coughs> front page story for the number one paper in the Philippines. So then I got the attention of the president of the Olympic Committee and he basically asked for a meeting and I chatted on what chiropractic could do and and he said okay and that was a 10 12 year journey of traveling you know I, i've done three olympics uh about seven asian games five southeast asian games and if you're working with people who are so fine-tuned like they know their body and remember we were talking about the concept of neurological tone right mm -hmm. so uh Motor function and sensory function are functions of neurological tone. And elite athletes who require uh, proprioceptive information coming to and from their prefrontal cortex and their brain and responding, and even just motor nerve activation. You know, it, it, when you're working with elite athletes at this level and they feel this firing or this change in milliseconds, in terms of their, if it's a swimmer, the feel of the water, if it's the boxer when they come in, if it's the squash player, it's this, you know, that, that enhanced perception um, of, of their selves and their bodies and their timing and coordination, you see them perform at an optimal level, that is amazing. And if you have the ability to do it seconds or minutes before they actually go out and compete, then you have full activation. Like they're the best that they could be for that particular period. So, you know, I was there when the Philippines delivered their first Olympic medal in 20 years in Rio. And I felt like, you know, it really takes a village to deliver a medal, but that feeling of satisfaction of having been there and being part of the team that actually helped this person. So, uh, you know, achieve a weightlifting medal. So you get to see just a broad spectrum of the general population and the, the population that is more concerned about um, specifics and, and a little more detailed in their neurological system, I guess you could say. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. Uh, there was an interesting study that was out of the New Zealand Chiropractic College where they took uh, six Taekwondo athletes. It was a small sample, right? And they, it was a crossover study and they measured muscle activation pre and post adjustment. And they did a comparative, which is a sham adjustment. It was amazing. I mean, if you look at the, the measure of muscle strength, you know, and what was interesting was the people that they crossed over. So there were 12 elite Taekwondo athletes. So initially, Six got adjustment. They did pre-post measurements of muscle strength and activation. And you look at the bar chart. It's amazing, right? And then the people who did not got to get adjusted crossed over to the adjusted side. And the ones who got adjusted cross over to the non-adjustment side. And you saw the same bar chart. Amazing stuff. You know, amazing stuff. And this is one thing that I want to share with people, right? Is that when you talk about evidence, please consider the whole spectrum of evidence. We just have 
people quoting RCTs, meta-analysis. Come on, guys. You have case reports. You have case studies. You have case series. You have observational studies. Those are all valuable. So I'm, I'm quoting to you a study that was done on 12 Taekwondo athletes. Nonetheless, it proves muscle activation for an elite amateur athlete. So, I mean, it's a form of science. So don't tell me that because it's a case study, because it's a case series, because it's not an RCT or a meta, that it has no value. Come on, guys. We see this every day. We see it in our offices. We see that's observational studies. Just because I don't have the time to write it down and to put it in the format that it takes to be published doesn't make it not valuable. So when you talk about evidence, let's talk about the whole spectrum of evidence and not marginalize it to just RCTs and meta-analysis, which I agree is important. It's important, but it's not the only thing. So, you know, um, I don't believe that there should be a separation in the profession. I think people need to unify, but they need to unify under common principles that hold the profession together. We all want to help patients, right? We all want to help people. Now, what is the best way of doing that? You know, so I, I think people get caught up fighting about does the subluxation exist or not? Or what to call it? I, I, I really don't care what you call it, but you can observe that it's there and it does exist. You have your indicators, and when you treat it, those indicators go away and the patient feels better. Right. Or the patient walks away or their headaches go away or, hey, you know, you treated me for my low back pain, but, you know, I don't get dysmenorrhea anymore or whatnot. You know, just, it's just, it's, it's amazing. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm very critical. I'm very scientific. I can communicate clearly with all sorts of healthcare providers. My best friend is a neurosurgeon, you know what I mean? And, and we have very interesting discussions, but I think that the profession has to get together in unity and, and agree, let's put together the points that they agree on and move forward with those rather than picking on the differences. It's just, you know, it's not gonna serve us well. Right, that reminds me of there's like a Native American proverb that it talks about no tree would fight among its own branches mm -hmm. and so i mean yes. it makes sense why would we fight with one another instead of just talking with one another um rationalizing and also really brainstorming i mean we don't know everything yeah. uh, it is an amazing profession and it saddens me when i see the divisions in the profession and how people get caught up fighting about terms that really don't mean anything and there's so much energy wasted that could be used for something else. Right, yeah, for the patient. Exactly, the more value we provide, the more necessary we become as a healthcare profession around the world. And there are politics against the chiropractic profession. We do have to accept that. You know, uh, it is, uh, it's a, it's a loaded, you know, it's loaded against us. And we just have to understand that. And we have to work in the best possible way to gradually over time, build that trust, build those bridges and continue working in a way where we, 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 we match. That makes sense. And speaking of, of laws against us and laws for us, if someone were to consider either moving to the Philippines or relocating back to the Philippines, um, what is the practice look like and requirements for licensing? Okay, so um, the requirements are very straightforward. No? So you have to be grad, uh, a graduate of a school uh, that is recognized uh, by uh, CCE or so any of those WFC schools. So it would have to be what we would consider a DC or a doctorate in chiropractic, right? Now, if you're foreign, meaning non-Filipino, you would have to have a license to practice where chiropractic is regulated by law. 
So if you have a license to practice in the United States, Australia, or, or any country where it's regulated by law, we would accept that. And then you have to do a six month supervisory uh, uh, period. And at the end of that six months, if your chiropractic supervisor gives the okay, then you're given a registration to practice chiropractic in the country. So it's very straightforward. You have filled this whole interview with such wisdom of, of the chiropractic profession and joining together and, and really providing value to, to our patients, being patient or person-centered as part of the, of the Be Epic principles. And to finalize this interview, is there any other tidbit of wisdom that you can offer recent graduates or new practitioners? Don't commoditize the profession. You keep complaining. I want to be treated like a professional. You keep complaining. Don't go to work in shorts, Birkenstocks, and a freaking t-shirt. <laughs> Dress like a professional. Right. Number two, talk like a professional. Right? So if you talk and blabbing away about programs and packages and you sound like a used car salesman, don't complain when people treat you like that. Number three is don't commoditize the profession. We are not a, you know, a product or a, a, a thing that you can buy, which means don't talk about price, talk about value. Ooh. $20 an adjustment, $10 an adjustment, free this, free that. Don't cheapen yourself. You know, my dad gave me this wonderful piece of advice. He started this interview with my dad, and I think I'm going to end it with my dad. Because as I was packing my suitcase, uh, my dad never entered my room. And for this night, you know, he entered my room. He was watching me pack. I was getting my stuff ready you know, to go off to school in the U.S. And I was going to be there for a, a, a lengthy period of time. And he looked at me and he goes, you know, Martin, don't think about the money. Think about getting people well. The money will follow. And that's the best advice I can give people. Focus on the value. Everything else will follow. I thank you so much for imparting your wisdom today, imparting your experience, sharing with us stories from your family, from your professional life, um, and working all the way up to the World Health Organization. And that is what World of Chiropractic is about. Learning about the areas of chiropractic, learning about the practice of chiropractic, and garnering wisdom from the leaders of the field of chiropractic. So I thank you so much for, for imparting that today, Dr. Cameron. Oh, you're most welcome.